reading are two short readings, one from Colossians, one from Ephesians. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then from Ephesians, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I will be the first to admit that our relationship, pastor to parishioner and back and forth, can be a little bit challenging because we don't have much of an opportunity to really get to know each other, at least most of us. You know who I am, you know who my family is, but we don't have all those wonderful opportunities we have with, you know, you have with your family and other people to really interact and get to know each other on a deeper level. So I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. If you already know this, fine, but if not, I just want you to be clear. We are a family who loves our dogs. Got that? We love our dogs. And we don't have small dogs, we have big dogs. Our smallest dog was one that Andrew adopted in high school several years ago, and she's about 35 pounds, and that's the smallest one. The largest one we have is about 140 pounds, and she can literally walk up and set her chin on the dining room table and look at you. Okay, and we have some in between. And they are a blessing to our family. But there are times when I honestly say they are pests. Okay, like Milo. You see him up here at church with me every now and then. We sprang forward in the clock this morning. He woke me up even earlier. Figure that out. It was before 5 o'clock and he woke me up because he's like a rooster. He thinks when the first spark of light shows up, I'm supposed to get out of bed. So every morning at about 6 o'clock, he's waking me up. This morning it was 5. I can't figure it out because it got dark later, but he got me up earlier. We love them. They're a blessing, but sometimes they're pests. That's the reality of when you have dogs. I share that with you because I tell, I tell, I tell you I've always had big dogs. When I was about 10 years old, 10 and a half, when all the bad crap was starting to happen in my life, I was given a dog. His name was Willie. Willie was, to this day, the largest Irish setter I've ever seen. At, at 10 or 10 and a half years old or so, Willie could jump up and put his paws on my shoulder and his head was taller than me. He was a fabulously beautiful, wonderful dog. At time, a pest. Because when it rained and thundered, it didn't matter what kind of kennel you had him in, he was getting out. He would go through the roof, he would dig under, he would tear holes in it, he was going to get out. He was going to jump the fence and he was going to run the alleys. And I have spent more days, afternoons, running in the rain, chasing that dog than I care to remember. Because it would thunk, he'd hunker down and go that much faster. He was a pest at times. But he was my best friend. I would take him to the farm. And if I was walking in the woods hunting, he was with me. If I was riding my horse, he was running beside me. He was a fabulous friend. He simply wanted to be with me. And I wanted to be with him. And I remember it so vividly because the sad reality is there came a time when he was just given away without my knowledge. I came home one day and he was gone. And I never forgot what kind of a unique dog he was for me at that time in my life. Sometimes it's nice just to have somebody who wants to walk with you and be with you and somebody you want to be with. This sermon series is about walking with God, about what it means to live in a real day in, day out relationship with a God who loves us and wants to be with us. Last week we talked about walking in love. Today we talk about walking in the light as children of light. And that image, walking in the light, you would think is kind of self-evident as to its meaning. It shouldn't take a whole lot of explanation. But the sad truth, it does. Because when we look at the world around us, when we look at the church, Christians in the world around us, we have missed the mark. We have lost sight of what it means to be light in the midst of darkness. I can say that because 
it doesn't take you very long to figure out that there's not a whole lot of difference, in, at least in our culture and society today, between the Christians and the non-Christians. And look at the divorce rates. There's only a fractional difference between the divorce rates among Christians and non-Christians. The use of pornography is only fractionally different. We've come to a point within the Christian world that sex before marriage is okay. We don't think anything about it. The unbelieving world hasn't thought anything about it for years. And with all this going on in the lives of Christian adults, it's no wonder that Christian kids and families are getting wrapped up in drugs and alcohol at the same statistical rate as children in families that never go to church. You see, we have lost our understanding of what it means to be light in the world, to be different than the world. And yet Jesus is calling us to walk as children of light. The Apostle Paul tells us in, in, Roman, or in Ephesians, they were darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. They were darkened in their understanding. See, darkness is a fitting image. Because all through scripture, darkness is the image used to talk about sin and evil, and light is the image to speak about holiness and righteousness and all that is good. And darkness is a fitting image because people want to hide their evil deeds in the darkness. I mean, most of you, or a lot of you, are going to go out to eat after, after church today. When you walk into the restaurant, and every restaurant in El Paso has TVs all over the walls, do you expect to see porn playing on them? Or the afternoon football game? Or basketball? You see, they won't put the evil out in plain sight. They will hide it, but it's there. Have you ever been in Walmart and seen some guy walk up and just, just slap his wife or girlfriend right in the middle of the store? Probably not. Because it would be seen for what it clearly is as evil. And evil loves to exist in the darkness, not in the light. And so he'll go home. He'll shut the door. He'll close the blinds. And then he'll hit her. Because darkness doesn't want to be seen for the evil that it is. And the reality is, as Paul talks about it, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, life apart from God is darkness. And that's who we were. That's who all of us were. We came into this world as those who were separated from God because darkness is a fitting image of all those who do not have a relationship with God, all those who live without God. That is who we were. But then Paul tells us something changed. Something happened. God did something. Paul tells us in our text that you heard a minute ago, for you were once darkness, but now you are children of children. I'm sorry, once you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He doesn't say you were in darkness. He says you were darkness. He doesn't say you now walk in the light. He says you are light. There's a difference. When we came into this world, we were darkness. No good, no righteousness, no holiness, no hope. But he says now you are Light, Not in the light, but you are light in the Lord. So what happened? How did that change for us? You ever been in the darkness? Deep darkness, so present you can almost feel it, like when you go into Carlsbad Caverns and they turn off the lights, where you cannot see your hand in front of your face. You don't know which way to go. Because you can see nothing. That's the darkness of sin and unbelief. And yet God intervened. Paul tells us, God has delivered you from the dominion of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. That literally means that God reached out of eternity and took hold of you in the midst of the darkness because he wanted you and he picked you up and moved you out of the darkness, out of the kingdom of Satan and set you down in the kingdom of his son. It was fully and completely by God's design, by his action. He chose to save you. He chose to rescue you. The question that we want to understand 
is how did he do this and why? Well, the how is both simple and dynamic. How? Jesus is the short answer, for sure. Jesus, God's only son, came into this world and suffered and died up on the cross so that forgiveness could be won, so that those in darkness would have hope, so that those in darkness could have life. Forgiveness could be real. But once we speak of Jesus and the cross, his dying for the whole world, how do I understand how he did that for me? What does it mean that he saved me? What did God do? How much has God done to save you? Jesus died for you, but you're in darkness. Jesus is the light of the world, but you dwell in the midst of darkness with no hope, with only sin and unbelief. So God chose to intervene. He came to you, maybe in the waters of your baptism or in the message of, of Jesus as the light of the world, the Savior. He came to you, and in that moment when that word of promise touched your heart, the Spirit of God pierced the darkness in which you existed, and light enveloped your heart. And with the light came forgiveness, and with the light came faith. And in that moment, he took hold of you and said, you're no longer darkness, and he picked you up, and he set you down and said, now you are the light. You see, God not only died for you on the cross, but he came to you individually and personally, so that what he accomplished for the world could be yours, so that you who were darkness could be saved, could be light, that you could be rescued. That's the how. Maybe the bigger question is why? Why would God do this? We've caused God nothing but heartache and pain we have rebelled and rejected and sinned against God at every turn. Why would God do this? We know how, but why? Again, the answer is both simple and dynamic. Simple answer, God loves you. But once you speak of God's love, you can plumb the depths so deep you will never reach the bottom. Why does God love me? Why would God do all this for me? Well, I'm going to give you two reasons. First, he knows you. Understand, before the world was created, before God spoke and said, let there be light and called creation into existence, when it was just the Father, the Son, and the Spirit dwelling in unity and harmony together in his heart of hearts, he knew you. He knew your spirit and he loved you from afar. And because he loved you, he was moved not only to create you so he could live in relationship with you, but to save you because he knew you would rebel. He knew you would turn away. He knew we would sin. So he already determined to send Jesus before he ever called you into existence. He knows you. Jeremiah is told, he says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you and appointed you a prophet to the nations. God knew us in eternity because he wanted us. And not only does he know us, the Bible tells us he rejoices over us. You ever seen a, a mother's face when she's got her little girl all dressed up, young mom, and somebody there says, oh, your daughter looks just like you. You ever see a mother's face light up with a smile when someone says that, says that to her? Or a, a dad whose young son is there and, and they'll say, boy, he's a chip off the old block. He's a spitting image of dad. And dad's chest kind of puffs out a little bit and he gets a grin on his face because our, my son looks like me. You were created in the image of God. He made you and molded you and shaped you to be in his image. And he is excited about that. He rejoices in that. In fact, Zechariah tells us 
The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exalt, exalt over you with singing. Can you imagine God's heart rejoicing and celebrating and singing over you? Because he created you in his image and he celebrates who you are. How deep does the love of God go for you? You'll never reach the depth. He knows you and he rejoices over you. That is why he saved you. And that is why you are no longer darkness. You are light. You were not in darkness. You were darkness. That is sin and unbelief. But now you are light in the Lord. He has changed everything about you. When he took hold of you and said, I claim you as my own. I make you my child and picked us up out of the kingdom of darkness and set us down in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We are light in the world. A young lady got a new job and her pastor rejoiced with her. She'd been searching for a job for a long time. And after a few weeks in the job, she made an appointment to come see her pastor. And she walked in, sat down and said, I'm gonna quit this job. And he looked at her kind of funny because he thought this was a good job. And she said, I can't handle it anymore. I'm the only Christian in the entire factory. And they mock and ridicule and make fun of me all the time. I'm just going to quit. And the pastor thought for a minute and said, answer a question for me. Where do people hang lights at? She said, what does that have to do with anything? I said, just humor me. Answer my question. Where do people hang lights? She said, well, I guess in dark places. She said, you're exactly right. And that factory you work in is filled with darkness. There is no light there. You are a child of God. You are the light. And you are the only light that can shine in that darkness right now. And for the first time it dawned on her that it was not just a job, it was an opportunity to serve God. And so with renewed determination, she went back to work in that factory and dialogued with the women she worked with. And within a couple of months, God had used her to lead nine of the young ladies out of the darkness into the light. We teach our children cute little songs when they're little. Now, clear your voices, clear your throat, get ready. Let's sing it. This little light of mine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. What's the second stanza? Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. And yet, what have we done? What have we done as those who are light when we have conformed to the image of the world around us, when our lives are no different than the lives of those who don't know God? We've hidden our light under a bushel. Our light is beginning to grow dim and the world can no longer see the light of Christ in us because we have conformed to the image of this world instead of to the image of Christ. That has to change. We have to change. We have to understand that we are light in the world and that we are here as those who created the image of God because he loves us and he rejoices over us and he wants to use us to shed light into the midst of the darkness of this, wor of this world so people can literally be rescued by God. When I was a kid... And if you grew up in West Texas, this will make no sense to you at all. When I was a kid over in Central Texas, we had fireflies. Have you ever had fireflies? Yeah? And right, at, right as the sun goes down and starts getting dark, they come up out of the grass. And they begin to fly around, and the little rumps light up and blink like little, little yellow stoplights up in the sky. And we, I was mesmerized by them. And as an aside, you know, kids today get glow sticks and wave them around, and they get those glow rings and put them around their neck. We found out if you break the butts off of them and smear them on your skin, the glow juice will go on your skin, and you'll glow at night. So we'd have stripes on our foreheads and stripes on our cheeks and stripes on our hands. <laughs> That's so nasty. But we did it, and we would glow in the middle of the night. It was such a neat thing. 
But I've since discovered that fireflies are the most amazing creatures because at every point of their life, they produce light. As an egg, the same chemicals that are there, the eggs will glow. As larvae, they glow like the adults. All the way to adults, when they can fly, they have the ability to shine light. It is part of who they are. It is their makeup. It's how they are created. And they're very efficient at the production of light. An incandescent light bulb will take all the energy it receives and 90% of it will be, will be expelled in heat and 10% in light. A firefly re, t- uses 100% of its energy to produce 100% of light. It's simply who they are. Those who give light. Understand, you are the fireflies of the human race. In the midst of a world of darkness, you do not have light in you. You are the light because you are in Christ. And your light can shine into the darkness and overcome sin and evil and unbelief. Your light can shine into the darkness and open the way for Christ to save people, for the Father to reach out of eternity and say, no longer are you lost. I claim you as my own and rescue people who can't even see where they're going. We are the light of the world. So when Paul tells us we are no longer darkness, we are light in the Lord, walk as children of light, understand, like smearing the firefly juice on my face, we simply have the light to share. And we can light the way for the world. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord and the life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.